question. The committee will now hear from Digital Rights Watch. For the Hansard record, would you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear before the committee? Yep, my name is Tim Norton and I'm the chair of Digital Rights Watch. Can we probably turn the volume up a little bit? Yep. Okay. How are you? Although the committee does not require you to provide evidence under oath, I wish to advise that this is a formal proceeding of the Parliament. Giving false or misleading evidence is a serious matter and may be regarded as contempt of Parliament. These proceedings are being broadcast and recorded by Hansard. I will now invite you to make an opening statement. The committee will then proceed to questions. We have a copy of your submission. Thank you. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to give evidence. Um, yeah. We've provided uh, for this um, inquiry and we've outlined a number of uh, concerns, some risks and a few recommendations that we wanted to put forward. I think ultimately there is a in the way that political parties and politicians are using communication methods. Um, and we're talking predominantly digital media, social media. That's very different from how we originally envisaged that members of parliament and political parties would engage with their constituents. Now, there's a few opportunities there. Um, if we're talking about being able to target directly to constituents, social media, online advertising, they actually provide a really good opportunity to target communications to constituents in a relevant way. It's very easy to get down to the people in your area and give them information that's relevant to them and engage with them, which you know lowers the bar for participation in democracy. And that's a good thing. The problem comes when you look at the risks associated with those sort of uh, behaviours. And if we're looking at one in particular, of micro-targeting of advertising, that creates one particular communication channel that goes directly to a human being. No other human can actually see that engagement. So we have a huge transparency and accountability problem. You know, when you're targeting communications to one person only, you have huge power over those people. You're able to give them a message that may manipulate them, it may push them in a certain way on their political spectrum, and importantly, other people can't see that happening. In the past, we had mechanisms such as broadcast media, town halls, and that was an open forum. We had people who could see that engagement and they could critique it, they could see if others were being manipulated or being targeted with certain messages, and we had a, a wholesome view of how that was engaging. With the rise of Digital media and targeted micro-targeting, uh, that transparency doesn't exist anymore. So there's a huge concern there over the power that's, that we have and how we're almost by default manipulating a constituency. Uh, we're also concerned about the power dynamics that play there. Incumbent MPs and, and larger political parties have greater power than that of micro-parties, independents, and people who want to engage in a political discourse but don't have that, that history behind them. Not just monetarily, but also over time building up huge databases, building up uh, lists of people that you want to send these messages to, being able to feed that system into digital media to be able to target them uh, more directly. There's a discrepancy in the power dynamics there and concerned about how that where that ends up. You know, if we look at political parties and the databases that have built the last couple of years, that's getting more and more powerful now. And I think uh, ultimately we see that there's some easy solutions to this. And the primary one being to set that tone from the top down. Make sure that those accountability, transparency and power dynamics are actually addressed. At the moment, political parties, contractors, members uh, are all exempt from the Privacy Act whereas corporations, non-profits and other groups have to be held to a higher standard to ensure that they're actually protecting the privacy and the engagement of the people that they're, that they're targeting. So a very easy first step to show, not just from an accountability measure, that this is necessary, but also to kind of show that, that morally and ethically this is an important issue, would be to remove that exemption, to ensure that people who are in elected positions are actually held to the same Others are. Um, and there's been a precedent set here in the United Kingdom, which is that the UK Information Commission are called for an ethical pause of digital targeting and digital media in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And that would be uh, a hold on all this kind of activity, which would then give the Parliament and the people time to develop a code of conduct. So there's a few other recommendations we've put in the submission. 
Um, but yeah, I welcome any questions that the committee may have. Uh, thank you. I'll just check. Um, Senator Walters, did you join us online then? Yes, I did. I was waiting for a call and it's now come through. I'm here now. Excellent. Good stuff. I'll hand over to uh, Mr Giles to kick off. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr Norton, for your submission and for your evidence today. Can I start by saying uh, I found the most useful aspect of your submission was your call for a bit of first principles under the heading, when does the use of social media to influence the political debate become a problem? Setting out um, three markers that I think are useful markers to guide us forward in deception, distortion and lack of transparency. I just wanted to acknowledge that which shaped my thinking in looking at the other submissions as well. I just had a couple of comments really going to your recommendations. Firstly, on this question of an ethical pause. Now, I understand a recommendation has been made in the UK. What has been the response from government there? As far as I know, it hasn't been implemented. Um, a lot of that was in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Yeah. And so I think the, the reaction to that was very reactive, essentially. Um, it was very much like, well, this, is, this has gone really, really bad let's stop everything and go back to first principles and see where we go. Now, as far as I know, that actually hasn't happened. Um, and you might say that they've got bigger problems on their hands at the moment than you say. Um, but I think the main thing there is the, the focus on a halt of the practices which we have found so horrible in the wake of Cambridge Analytica and the evidence that a lot of political parties and political operatives were actually taking advantage of those systems. Thank you. And um, the other issues I was just interested in, I'm, I was wondering, you, you refer to um, the example of Germany, Austria and Switzerland and, and apparently other nations in requiring Impressum section on Facebook pages. Can you explain a little more about that? and how it has been the case that Facebook has obviously responded positively in those jurisdictions to that requirement. Yeah, I think the best example there is actually what we've seen in the US with political ads. Um, so Facebook made very uh, strong strides in the right direction. They've now required that any political ads within the US jurisdiction require information that allows people to quickly and easily discover who placed the ad, uh, who they are supposed to get with, uh, where do I find more information? What's the price of supply if I have a problem with these ads? All of that is actually embedded within the visible ad as it appears to people. Mm. Uh, and that has not, did not exist in the past. So again, it goes back to transparency. At the moment, uh, especially with things like dark ads on Facebook, we don't know who's placing them. We don't know who they're targeting. We don't know how it's being reacted to those people when they're being targeted. And no one else can see that happening. Facebook did make a step in the right direction and be able to say, even if you're not the person being targeted, here is a place where you can go and find what is the Democratic Republic, the Democratic Party doing in the state of Georgia, and here is a list of their ads. Now, that's a really good step towards that transparency we're talking about. But it's only happened with pressure from legislators. In the US, that was mostly in reaction to the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandals. Mm. Uh, in places like Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, that was um, members of parliament such as yourself actually pushing on Facebook and saying this is what we need to see to have that accountability. And can I, if I can just have the chair's indulgence, really two follow-up questions on this. One is what's the, what would you see as the gold standard on this issue and what resourcing or other support would the Australian Electoral Commission require to, to provide effective regulatory oversight and enforcement? In terms of the gold standard, I think it has to be uh, ultimate transparency. If we can see even that level that I spoke about before, about the US political ads, and making sure that we have a space where we can see who is behind these uh, targetings and with the, behind these advertising campaigns, hmm. um, that's a huge first step to allow the user to engage directly when they see those ads. But the other way to go about it is actually to have a clearinghouse of election material, um, to have a place where all electoral advertising, all electoral materials are archived, they are cross-referenced and they are linked back to people. So that if you want to know what any political party or operative is doing, you can go there and see everything that's actually happening. 
Now, that would be, uh, again, a huge accountability measure to ensure those political parties are operating ethically. It's also a transparency measure to ensure that if you want to go and find out more, here is a clearinghouse for everything. In terms of the teeth that you need to give the AEC to do that, then you need to be able to... Um, uh, you need to be able to give them the power to have that insight, to have that, that ability to collect that information. I mean, ultimately, the AEC needs dedicated capacity to maintain that digital literacy. Uh, they should not be taken by surprise when they see something after it's already hit the media, after it's already hit the public's eyes. So I'm not saying you need to actually give them the power to stop political advertising because that would be a huge just on democracy. But the the people can have could you, sorry, uh, could you just re repeat that last bit, please? There was a bit of an interference then. Sorry, just that uh, you don't need to give the AEC the power to stop things before they go to market. I think that would be an impediment to democracy. But you need to give them the ability to witness and see this materials well before it's actually already gone out, already had the damage, already gone to people in a certain way. Thanks very much, Mr. Norton. Mr. Morton. Uh, thank you. I, look, I'm, I'm not so so much convinced that the AC needs to um, be a clearinghouse of political advertisements before they're um, made public, because that would create all sorts of issues in relation to um, freedom of speech and political communication. But I wanted just to just drill down a little bit more in relation to what you see as the AC's role here. Um, I. Th Correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand from you that you, you don't see the AEC's role as uh, fact-checking, vetting information. Um, uh, you, you, you see the AEC's role in making sure that political material that's seen, that it is designed to influence voters, is appropriately transparent in relation to who is funding and producing that material, that it is that you want the AEC empowered to make sure that um, that the material is authorised correctly, I suppose, in accordance with the with, with the electoral act. Is that a, is that correct? Is that is that where you see the difference? Yeah, definitely. I, you don't want to have the AEC involved in the content of this material, um, but more in ensuring that it's transparent as to who is actually manipulating the strings behind it. And, and you you mentioned in relation to in your recommendations um, requiring Facebook to respond to AEC inquiries within a set period of time. Um, Again, using this example, this isn't in relation to what the advertisement is actually saying, claiming it is in relation to uh, the AEC uh, ensuring there is appropriate transparency through the enforcement of the authorisation provisions in the Electoral Act, making sure that Facebook respond to the AEC inquiries where there may, or may, where there may be an ad that, that isn't uh, suitably authorised in accordance with the Electoral Act. Is that right? That's right, but there are examples where it may, it may uh, also involve the content. So we used an example in our submission of uh, ads that were placed in the lead up for the same sex postal vote. Now they broke the Parliament's own recommendations in terms of the content and the style and the way that people were allowed to engage in that debate. Now, because they were digital ads, they took more than a month to be taken down. And mm. it was very, you know, because uh, the AEC did not have the power to compel Facebook to do so, and it required intervention from the Special Minister of State before it was even taken down. Now, that, that, of that, that ad being visible, and that is way too much influence and flouting the rules that were set by the Parliament. So we have to sort of review, well, what are the mechanisms and how can we compel social media giants like Facebook, who own and operate these platforms for us, how can we regulate if we don't have the power to actually enforce those rules? Should should Facebook? Uh, sorry, I, I feel a little bit terrible singling out Facebook, but should should um, uh, organisations such as Facebook um, have particular responsibilities in this in this authorisation space for the material that um, is published on their on their sites to ensure compliance with the Electoral Act, perhaps? No, I think it needs to be, the emphasis needs to be back on the people who are actually placing these ads. So if we're talking about political parties or MPs or political operatives, that's where the code of conduct needs to sit. But, 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 sorry, but what you're saying though is, is that if there is an ad that has been placed on Facebook that isn't in accordance with the Electoral Act, 
um, from, from a transparency and authorisation requirement. Um, you're saying that it shouldn't, those organisations that, um, uh, like Facebook, shouldn't have any requirements on them to make sure their political ads are in accordance with the, with, 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 um, the Electoral Act? I'm saying from a practical point of view, we need to ensure that those ads are taken down and that requires going directly to the platform. Um, and so there needs to be a mechanism to ensure that it stops being published or it stops being um, sent out to the public. Um, but ultimately, the accountability has to come with the people who place those. And so that's where the, the actual emphasis on responsibility needs to lie. Yeah, yeah but if the... I'm a little bit confused here because you're asking the platform to take responsibility on uh, the taking down of ads that are, not, that are not compliant with the Electoral Act, but you're not asking the platform to have some responsibility for ads that are, uh, that are published on their platforms that are not compliant with the Electoral Act. So wouldn't, wouldn't these platforms be more likely to take down, uh, even if it's momentarily, until ads are then compliant with the Electoral Act, if there was some uh, uh, requirement or penalty against them if they didn't? Yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, I think ultimately uh, any platform needs to act on the direction of the regulator. So if that is, it's the AEC's, or it should be the AEC's job to decide whether or not uh, an ad is actually compliant with the regulations that they set. Then they can direct any platform, any publisher, to comply with that. We don't want to get to a situation where we have private companies who are actually responsible for these huge platforms and have the power to disseminate information. We don't want to give them the power to decide what is right and wrong. No, no, I we agree entirely. No, I agree. Direction. But we don't want to put that. And that's why I put the emphasis back on the people who place the ads and on giving the governing bodies such as the AEC the power to direct that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator Waters. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. And Thanks, Mr. Singleton Norton, for your evidence today and your submission. Um, can you tell us some Australian examples of the sort of conduct that you think we should be regulating to prohibit? What are some of the worst domestic examples of why we need some reform? I think we're actually a bit uh, relieved that there aren't a lot of with the context. Um, so I mentioned before, some of the acts that were placed during the same sex vote were a really good example of uh, advertising that was very, very targeted to people in an emotional way. It was designed to trigger homophobia, to trigger uh, a no vote. Uh, and it did so in a way that was, that was very targeted to what we emotionally assumed would be a response like to vote no. That's a really good example of things we've seen elsewhere around the world. You know, we've seen it predominantly in the US, where a lot of that targeting happens in the Midwest. Um, and, in, and the important thing is that there's no accountability for what happens to those, those ads, or what happens to the people who actually are manipulating that system. Um, we do see political party engaging in this sort of micro-targeting. Now, it's not to the level of where it's um, false news and fake ads. But it is still pushing the boundaries. You know, it's, and this is where I think you don't want to get into a space where you're trying to govern the ethics of what is a credible political message. On the one hand, you want to deliver a message that engages with people, that's relevant to their interests, and keeps them engaged with your political persuasion, whatever that is. You don't want to be in the space then when you're manipulating people to come around to your point of view. So. I actually think the debate not, needs to not happen at the, in the space of what is an ethical act, what is an ethical way of engaging in politics, and ultimately just more on more transparency and more accountability so that people can see that happening, and then they can be their own judge. I mentioned before the example of open town halls, where everyone's in the room, everyone can hear what is being said, and you might be able to turn around and say, that was a message for this kind of person, and that's going to push them in that certain way. And that makes me feel this about that message. That's fine. That's a good way to engage in that democracy. When we're talking about micro-targeting and dark ads and no one can see that happen, there's none of that transparency. There's none of that watching what's happening. And I think that's the concern that we have, is that the more we get into this splintered process 
of targeted messages to people in certain ways, the less accountability we have about how that's actually happening. Mm. So do you know any examples of Australian political parties potentially abusing personal data for this sort of targeted political advertising? Again, unfortunately, we get into an ethical dilemma. At the moment, it's perfectly legal um, in that political parties and MPs are exempt from the Privacy Act. So if we want to talk about uh, abusing data, there's an ethical abuse, I think, that's occurring there in that they're retaining huge data sets of constituent information and then using them to target messages back to them for a political gain, mm. i.e. be it re-election, be it a gain in support for a political um, issue or a policy. Um, legally, it's perfectly fine. And I think that's where the parliament needs to actually assess that. Our Privacy Act was written in 88. Mm. And the internet in its form, the, the World Wide Web, was not actually launched until about 99. Um, uh, sorry, it was a bit earlier than that, about 93. Um, but the point is that these acts were designed for an era in which we could never have envisaged this level of data and control. And I think that's what we need to address here, is that there needs to be an updating of that and the way we look at it. And there needs to be a, a definite updating of the why we've decided back then that political parties need to be exempt from the rules that they set for others. Indeed. Look, that's all from me at this point, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So you talk about um, so transparency with, with micro-targeting. Um, and, and you use the example of, of town halls as, as a transparent way of political communication. Um, but I suppose a, a lot of political parties have used direct mail, for example, a letter going to a certain person, you know, um, to you know, Mr. S Mr. Mr. Smith, who live at 3 Acacia Avenue. That's also not, using your analogy, that's also probably not transparent because that's direct targeted communication to a, a, a voter um, with a often a personalised message. Isn't micro-targeting just uh, the evolution of that in, in terms of it is also a, a private targeted message to someone but using a different platform? Yes, it is. Um, but there's two factors that make it hugely, incredibly more powerful. Um, the first one being cost. Uh, direct mail still costs. It is still a physical production and a physical engagement with Australia Post or whoever the mailer. Um, and that means that you make up a cost efficiency balance for how much can that message be targeted. You can't possibly send, or you, you could try, um, try and send a personalised letter to every one of the constituents that you're targeting and make it different for each one of them. Okay. It would be a huge amount of money to spend there. And so you make up the the balance by saying people in these area will get this message, people in this area will get that message. With digital micro-targeting, that cost barrier is reduced so low that you can actually send out millions of them and spend the same amount of money targeting hugely, you know, massive more amounts of people. The second one there is actually um, on whether or not uh, the uh, the data you're using to target that message and where you're actually getting that. So again, with postal voting or with postal mail, you're, you're targeting a person based on the information that you have. When you're talking on digital targeting, you can mash together data sets and build up a much more in-depth profile of the person that you're trying to target. So the micro-targeting, it is actually micro-targeting now, whereas before, I think it was, you're right, direct targeting, and you could sort of get directly to people. Now you can find out the individual information and then give them a message that's personal to them. So it's very much different from the direct mail targeting that we've seen in the past. And the power that actually exists in being able to put that out there is hugely increased. Is that a bad thing? Because people, you know, my, my experience is people complain they don't they don't think politicians in particular understand them, they don't understand their issues. Isn't it a good thing that, that politicians and, and political parties um, are able to communicate with people in terms of, of the issues that are of concern to an individual voter 
and, and target them in that way, so to bring them into, into the political process rather than treating them as some uh, you know, generic subset of, 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 the, of the community. Yes, I think there, there is an opportunity there, and that's why I started in my opening sort of statement about saying the opportunity to engage in democracy is actually, it is, it is one thing we can look at and, and be able to use the tools to bring people in. The problem comes, and we've seen this in countless examples, predominantly in the US, is that the concept of information asymmetry. You know, when you create micro targeted messages to a specific subset of people, you create hyper echo chambers. You, know, you create something that just feeds itself. If you assume that a certain person is going to be uh, predisposed to a message and you deliver that message, you're reinforcing that predisposition. You're not allowing that person to grow out of that bubble. You're just targeting them with what they want to hear. Now, is that, is that wrong? Sorry, uh, is, is, that, is that wrong? Because aren't, aren't humans able to make decisions based on, on not just what they're getting from, from, say, someone who's targeting them, but in terms of the, the entire community they live with and their family. Is, is that a bad thing, what you just said then? As long as the transparency exists that they can get out of that bubble, mm. that other people can see into that bubble. And that's where we've got a problem. Um, if, you receive, if you garner all your information from a couple of media sources and you never see the wide world and people don't see what you're reading, you'll never break out of that bubble. Mm. And it's the mm. same thing with micro-targeting. And the other thing is the power discrepancies. The people who are engaged in creating political messages, I'm making a mass you know, here, but they will be well educated, they will be well informed, they will be well read, and they will have the opportunity and the privilege to engage outside of those. Not all voters and constituents have that, that privilege. If they receive a message from someone with a higher authority than them, they will have an assumption that it is true. Now, whether or not it's true or not, that's why I said we can put aside the ethics of that. But we need to create a system for them to be able to question that truth. And if they don't have the privilege and the power to be able to do that, they are being manipulated. So just to, sorry, Chair, mm. Senator Walters was asking a question about examples of where Australian political parties had done this. And I'm thinking more and more about your evidence. And I share with you um, concern about people who are uh, getting their information from echo chambers that are reinforcing their pre-existing prejudice and those individuals not understanding uh, uh, that, that, um, uh, that they're within one of these echo chambers. But is the problem not coming from, you know, are Australian political parties the bigger issue here, or do you see it more as activist organisations who are engaging in this space? No, I think oh, of course you it, it's an example of how we're in, where our democracy is slipping into this process. So that's why I was within the Australian system because I actually don't think political parties are doing the wrong thing in this regard. I think they're at strong risk of doing so. Um, your question around whether activist groups are engaging in this, I don't think so. I think that they're no guilty than anyone else. And the important thing is the distinction around you as legislative power to legislate the rules for how you engage with the constituency. Activist groups do not. So well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, I had someone contact me the other day and they said, you know, th this, this issue is getting huge. You know, you've just got to look at your social media feed. Um, everyone's talking about live exports, um, for an example. Um, now, my social media feed wasn't talking about live exports one bit. Um, that person's social media feed and messages that they were receiving um, uh, uh, was very much alive with that issue, that in that individual's mind, uh, this was the only and biggest issue uh, affecting this nation at this point in time, which I think is an absolutely ridiculous suggestion myself. Um, uh, could it be that that person is subject to um, uh, targeting, um, paid or unpaid, because of that issue and therefore is living in that echo chamber as well? Yes, but we could make the same argument for people who read certain media sources. Uh, if you never read anything from a range of different media sources, you will receive a skewed view of the world. No, so I agree with you. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing, but in, in that particular example, we're talking about social media. Is that, is that the case there, that they could, be they could be targeted both paid and unpaid on that particular issue? They could be, yes. 
Can I just ask mm. a question, Chair, and thanks, Mr Norton, following on from Mr Morton, about um, the practicalities of oversight. Um, we've identified, or you've identified, some of the issues and some of the problems um, that we may be facing, um, go, particularly going into the next federal election. Um, in one of the sort of um, suggestions, when you say consider potential options to empower the AEC in the social media space, uh, do you believe the AEC have currently enough resources or how would increasing resources look like in a practical terms? Would it be an army of people sort of waiting to get the complaints, so to speak, or people monitoring social media feeds? Um, I'm just curious, I mean, we've sort of identified and Senator Waters identified some practical um, sort of examples. Moving forward, how would this practically work? I, I find how long's a piece of string argument comes into this, this space with new platforms being developed all the time, um, new ways of reaching out to people through all sorts of new technology as well. Yeah, and I think you're right. There is a problem of resourcing. I, I think the AEC is definitely the resource to be able to do this. Um, in terms of what's needed in that area, I probably need the benefit of the Parliamentary Budget Office to actually sort of, you know, figure out what that is. Um, but I think there are some steps that can be taken in the meantime, and that is that, that clearinghouse of material that is already being produced. If you had that, that library, that archive, and that requirement to have it registered, not pre-published, I, I agree that there's a, a problem there of getting it as a clearinghouse and getting it as a check and balance before it goes public creates some ethical dilemmas. But even having an archive of this information as it's put out, that would allow the public to see it. That would allow the public to have at its disposal every piece of political communication put out by a registered political party. And then we would have the court of public opinion as to whether it was ethical at the time. Now, even that doesn't solve the problem of stopping it as it hits market, but it at least, at least allows us to prosecute it post fact and be able to reflect on it and look back and say, was that okay? Who was it who put that out? And how do we hold them accountable in the future? If I can just jump in there for a sec, um, Mr. Norton, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I actually think political parties do have a high level of transparency at the moment. Um, you know, through the internal processes that we have, through a mass membership base organisation, all of those things. Uh, and we're, all, you know, as parties of, particularly the major parties, as parties for government, we're conscious of the fact that the lens is a lot stronger over us, in my opinion. I'm more interested in sort of individuals, uh, independents, um, minor kind of coalitions of, of people coming together. For example, if there was an action group set up in my electorate or uh, challenging me and um, talking about issues that they were perhaps, whether it be live export or the environment or money in politics, or all, all sorts of things. Um, how would you keep track on who those groups are? Because they're not going to be registered political parties. They're not going to be probably uh, registered to, to at all, they're just a, a group of citizens. Would it apply to those people as well? It raises a good question about what, who is a political operative. And I know that the parliament did debate this just recently in yep. the uh, foreign appearance laws. Um, and I think that is a very good question as to you know who are the people behind these um, these practices. Um, and you would you, you know you could conceive of an area where you get registered political parties or registered political operatives just getting others to do their work for them to avoid any regulatory oversight, and that's something we want to avoid. I think it has to come from a cultural change. It has to come from where you set the the bar as to how we want to engage in political discourse, and that will allow the public itself to say, well, we're not okay with these practices over here because we've seen how it can work ethically over here. In terms of whether or not political parties, major political parties, need to be held to the same standard, I think they definitely do because of the power dynamics. You know, yeah. Larger political parties have more power and more money to throw at these sort of campaigns. And that means they have ultimately more influence. So again, that's why I go back to okay. this idea of setting the tone from the top. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Uh, there are no other questions. Uh, thank you for your appearance here today. I don't think you've been asked to provide 
any further um, um, evidence, but if you, um, if you on, on notice, but if you do, by the 26th of November, please. So thank you very much, and we'll move on to the, uh, uh, the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much.